Hello, everyone. Welcome to ICC's Game of the Week with your host, as always, Joel Benjamin. This week, the ICC is paying tribute to former world champion Vasily Smyslov, who just passed away at the age of 89. Smyslov was champion for only a year before losing the title back to Botvinnik in 1958. But he had a long and respected career after that, representing the Soviet Union in the Olympiad from 1952 to 72 and winning a record total of 17 medals. He was still a world champion candidate in the 1980s. He was knocked out of the cycle in 1983 by Garry Kasparov, 42 years his junior. Now, obviously, there's a lot to choose from for Game of the Week. Since most Game of the Weeks are largely tactical battles, I thought I might pick a game that showcases Smyslov's technical prowess. I poured through my dog-eared copy of Smyslov's My Best Games, 1935 to 1957, for inspiration. That book is so old, not only are the games in dinosaur notation, a.k.a. descriptive, but the symbol for night is KT. Now, the USSR-USA match of 1946 was historically significant as the Big Red Machine took it to the U.S., who had been arguably the best team in the first part of the century. In defeating Arnold Danker, Smyslov play uh, looks modern and on target, but remember, this was 64 years ago. All right, so let's have a look. Smyslov against Danker. Smyslov uses the closed Sicilian in this game. And he goes for a line where White is delaying the development of his king side just a little bit. Um, Spassky used to like to play it mostly with f4 and sometimes knight g2. But here, uh, with the development of bishop to e3, sometimes White is going to follow up with queen d2 and at least put in Black's mind that he might bring that bishop to h6 if that knight moves off g8 and try to trade off those bishops and attack. Well, Danker answers with knight d4, and because of this game, uh, this move uh, came to be uh, considered dubious. Black can first uh, play d6, and only if white brings his knight into the game, let's say knight ge2, then knight d4 is a little bit more appropriate as the, as the game shows. Uh, but the move knight d4 is strategically a very sensible one for black because he wants to block the d-file. Once he plays the move e6, uh, he's going to have a weakness on d6, so he doesn't want that d-file to get open so easily. But in fact, that's what happens here. After knight d4, Smyslov plays knight ce2. And the reason why the C knight goes to e2 is because that uh, frees up white to, to push the pawn to c3 and, and drive away that knight or forces exchange. So here, if uh, black takes on e2 and takes on b2, this probably will come out uh, good for white. Rook to b1. First of all, if black gets super greedy with queen a5 check, bishop d2, queen takes a2, he will pay the price after bishop c3, tagging the queen and the rook on h8. Very nice skewer there. Backing up to this position, if black simply uh, retreats his bishop back to g7, white can take on c5 with some advantage, having traded a wing pawn for a pawn closer to the center. So we see d6, c3, and, well, black may, might be slightly better off taking on e2. And here it can kind of hold the center at the d4. It doesn't have to trade. Maybe queen c7. White probably has a little bit of nicer game, but uh, 
still black uh, is reasonably solid here. Denko decides to go uh, all the way back to c6 with the knight. Now to d4. C takes d4. Now on the next move and the move after that, white uh, avoids a capture with the pawn to build up a big center because with the center closed, white can't really take advantage of weaknesses in black's position that easily. Now, certainly it's okay to take with the pawn. But uh, he takes the knight, and after knight takes d4, recaptures again with the bishop. Now here, black might be slightly better off playing knight f6, just uh, developing. He still has some potential weakness with the pawn on d6, but uh, the bishop on d4, though it looks nice, is, uh, is blocking uh, any pressure black white has on d6. The black position is a little bit more flexible than in the game. So the move e5 is uh, certainly more committal for black now. Not only is the d6 pawn weak, but the d5 square in front of it as well. Here, Denker plays knight e7. Uh, Smyslov actually gives some nice analysis um, to show what could happen on knight f6, knight e2, bishop e6, castles, d5. e takes d5 with two possibilities. One, if uh, knight takes d5, he would simply play bishop c5, preventing castling at least uh, uh, right away, and that would leave white with some advantage. Then the move is bishop takes d5, queen a4 check, queen d7, queen takes queen, king takes queen, rook a d1, forcing the king to go one way or the other. Well, if king c6, rook takes d5. This is a blunder for black. White just wins material. So black has to go the other way. King e6, bishop h3 check, king e7, bishop c5 check, king e8, and now f4 with initiative for white. Black king is not only stuck in the center, but it, it has legally lost the right to castle. So knight e7 was played, knight e2, castles, castles, bishop e6, queen to d2. Now here black, of course, would love to get in the move d5 to rid himself of that weakness, but bishop c5 is too strong. That just uh, seems out of the question for black. White is starting to take on e7 and d5 now. And uh, d takes e4 is not playable because queen takes queen, followed by bishop takes e7, wins a piece for white. So Danker plays queen c7, and he's hoping uh, in the near future to get uh, something behind d5 and get that move in. And actually, you know, the position doesn't look too unreasonable, certainly, if he's able to achieve that move. Well, now. Smyslov makes a very deep assessment of the demands of the position, and this, of course, is a hallmark of champions. And I think that uh, the next move is really the nicest move of the game because it's just it's not very obvious at all. Smyslov plays rook fc1. And this, of course, subscribes to the theory that it's a good idea to put your rook on the file opposite your opponent's queen. Well, the, the other rook... Um, would would not make so much sense because it's uh, leaving the uh, the a2 pawn and also the uh, the a file which uh, white can make use of in certain variations. Now, first of all, note that if white just played a pedestrian move like rook fd1, just on the basis that okay, it's a half open file, that's where I should put my rook. Well, black plays rook fd8 and. Now he's getting ready to play d5 and solve all of his problems. So just goes to show that you need to play chess with the plan. And the move rook fc1 is planning to play pawn to c4. And this will clamp, on, clamp down on d5 forever.
black will not be able to achieve that move and free himself of that weakness. And white maybe can try to maneuver a knight to d5. Well, black would like to prevent this move with um, b5. Now, if white had just played b3, figuring, well, I don't really want my rook, my f rook on c1. I want it to go to d1 at some point. Well, then black could play b5. And uh, an a4, uh, well, with a b3 pawn hanging, he could even take on on uh, an a4. But he could also just protect the pawn with a6. So the, the, the main idea of the rook at fc1 is that b5, to prevent c4, does not work for black. And that's because move a4 is very awkward to meet. All right. What can black do? Well, if, um, if a6, now white switches the rook back to d1. And uh, it's really kind of funny how that works. Now if rook to fd8, now with these moves of the a-pawn in, a takes b5, white can t take uh, on uh, a8, and then the d6-pawn will be hanging. So black defends that pawn with rook a d8, then white can trade, and now rook a7. Big problem for black as he's losing material with this uh, skewer on, on his second rank. Well, the best black could do is um, perhaps just uh, to take on, on uh, a4, but uh, certainly uh, b5 has, has missed its mark. If that happens, white has a stru structural advantage. Well, so black basically just has to live with white getting the move c4. Uh, there's the old saying that the threat is stronger than the execution, and arguably that's true here. Uh, Danker wants to get some counterplay, so the white when white plays c4, he's not going to totally clamp down on the position. And so he plays f5. And this is a very double-edged move. Obviously, it, it gives black a little more activity, but uh, as the game continues, uh, Danker ends up just giving more squares to his opponent, creating more weaknesses for himself. So it's really on the edge as to whether this kind of uh, plan was, is, was going to work. All right, Smyslov answered with c4, the obvious point being that black can't take the pawn because he loses the bishop uh, due to the pin. But uh, now, Danker plays f takes e4, which is really another double-edged move. Uh, perhaps he could uh, wait in this position. Interesting variation is queen to d7, just getting off the line so that white will have to protect c4 before he can play knight c3. And now black can try f4. But I think white just takes that pawn and gives black the exchange. And I think that white has an awful lot of compensation. Certainly black is missing that, that bishop on the long diagonal. White uh, might uh, build up, maybe set up a battery on the long diagonal. And also black remains with this weak pawn on d6. White has a bishop pair. Just, uh, I think, a nice looking position for white. Now, instead of f4, if black plays uh, f takes e4, knight c3, we get a position rather similar to the game. So, what, what could black do instead? Well, I mean, he, he could try to wait with something like rook a d8, knight c3, and, and b6, just kind of hold the line in the center. This is perhaps a more modern way of playing. With the idea that if white ever captures on f5, black can take back with a pawn to try to control more squares in the center. And this would uh, uh, go along with, the old, uh, with another old expression, every Russian schoolboy knows that you take back on f5 uh, in the King's Indian with the pawn, control more cent central squares. 
Well, FTX E4 is, I guess, motivated by some tactical possibilities. Uh, I think that Denker was hoping that uh, Smyslov would not be able to play Knight C3, but he does play it anyway. Now, Black could try to take the pawn on C4, but it certainly looks very dangerous. Uh, first of all, there's, um, there's Queen takes C4, which is not too difficult for White. Knight takes E4 is a good answer. Queen A6. Queen takes D6. Rook C7, and here White has a clear advantage in the endgame. All right, a big question is Bishop takes C4 here. Uh, Smyslov uh, gave the following variation, and remember, there were no uh, chess engines to help anybody in those days. Uh, knight takes E4, D5, Knight G5, D4, Knight E6, D takes E3, Queen takes E3, Queen D6, Knight takes F8. Now, in this position, there's a couple of possibilities. One very nice line that Smithslaw pointed out was Bishop F7, Rook to D1, Knight to D5, Queen to B3. White is trying to make something of this pin. Rook to D8. And now, a, a very nice desperado move, Knight takes G6 which not only grabs a pawn for that knight on its way out, but also opens up the first rank, which is very important. Because after hg6, white is now taking on d5, and now utilizes some cross pins with rook d1. The queen can take that rook because of the pin on this diagonal. And when black takes the queen, white throws in rook takes rook with check, then takes back the queen with um, an extra exchange. So that's really a beautiful variation. Um, there is a slight problem that uh, black can improve on bishop f7, and that's with bishop to d5. Now, Smyslov gave bishop takes d5, knight d5, queen c5. But uh, he overlooked the move rook to d8. Uh, the knight on f8 is still trapped, and black will win two pieces for a rook and actually come out pretty pretty well on this line. So white uh, would pay kind of a high price for his imagination that we saw in the that other variation. Uh, now, if the bishop takes c4, knight takes e4, d5, white can kind of bail out with the move b3, and this actually leads to a very interesting uh, possibility, which, uh, which I uh, analyzed uh, before the game. Knight f5, knight g5, again looking at the e6 square, queen e7, temporarily sacrificing the piece to win it back with d4. Bishop d5 check, king h8, knight takes pawn on h7, D takes e3. This is somewhat forced. If black takes the knight, bishop g5, uh, white is definitely on top in this position. The center pawns are blockaded, and uh, black uh, pawns are kind of strewn about the whole board. So d takes e3. Knight takes f8. Uh, e takes d2. Knight g6, king h7. Knight takes e7. Black can take the rook and promote. Knight takes e7. Bishop takes b7. So we get to the end of a very long variation where white has three pawns for a piece. I think he's certainly standing pretty well, but um, I would have to say he's a long way from winning as well. So after bishop takes c4, the best thing for white to do might, uh, might simply... To pull, uh, might be simply to play uh, b3. And, and this actually uh, looks good for a safe edge because black, black retreats the bishop, white can take on e4 with a knight, 
and then uh, queen takes d6 on the next move. And uh, this this uh, looks like uh, it leaves white with a solid edge. So I don't know how concretely uh, Danker analyzed those possibilities, or he just uh, had a sense that uh, they were too dangerous. Uh, so he played instead knight to f5. But uh, really, he's kind of moving in a bit of a dangerous direction here because the trade of that knight for the bishop on e3 could be strategically unfavorable for black because that knight is a potential defender of the light squares in the center. And we see f from a lot of different uh, openings that white is often happy to trade that dark squared bishop for a knight to open up d5 for his pieces. Now, Denko was, I'm sure, just trying to play actively but um, it kind of backfires on him. Knight takes e4, and now he takes the bishop, which leads to kind of a simple position with an advantage for white. Could try to, to put the knight on d4. White is not really anxious to take that knight on d4 because black takes back with a pawn, even though he has double pawns. This pawn is very securely defended by the bishop on g7, and, and it is a passed pawn. So after... Um, after knight to d4, white has an interesting possibility of c5. Looks like a good aggressive move. Uh, if black takes on c5, the knight captures, and uh, that creates some annoying uh, threats of, of uh, discoveries. One line is queen e7, knight takes e6. Knight takes e6, white can try to pin. Rook a to d8. Bishop takes a7, and well, white can, can safely grab this pawn, um, and white can also, I think, play without without trying to grab any material, but uh, just uh, has, a, has an advantage after uh, knight takes c5. Black might try d5 instead here, keep his pawns together. Knight g5, bishop f7, and then the move f4 to undermine the knight on d4, and it seems that white uh, is d definitely developing initiative here. So if the knight takes e3, queen takes e3. It's very interesting that um, that looking at this position on some uh, chess engines, uh, the computers did not seem to be too upset with black's position, giving white only a slight edge. But uh, in reality, Black is, is really teetering on the edge of, of strategical annihilation because um, white is dominating these light squares in the center and he's in a position to play against black's uh, dark squared bishop which can't really positively affect um, the course of the game. The first, uh, Denker plays h6 to keep a knight from jumping in there. Rook to d1, hitting d6 pawn. And black moving that rook off the f open f file. I guess wanting to keep a7 um, guarded. So it's kind of a nice move order for Ness for white. Rook a c1, again, putting a rook opposite uh, the queen on the c file. b3, guarding that c4 pawn securely. Knight to c3. Well, this has the idea of bishop to d5 to trade off the light squared bishops. This is a very logical continuation. First of all, it removes the, uh, the bishop pair for black and also trades off his good bishop, and the one that can defend these squares in the center. And after that, black can't really challenge white on all these squares where he can no longer attack with a pawn. Well, you might expect that black would try to avoid that exchange, something like king h7. But here, white can play bishop e4, and the bishop is really on an excellent diagonal pointing at the king. And there might be also later ideas of pushing h4 uh, to intensify an attack on, on g6. And here, white is also putting on a, a lot of pressure Black uh, is already having to be very careful about defending the d6 pawn. And then he has to watch out about g6 as well. So that would not be an easy life for Black. But uh, certainly allowing bishop d5 
uh, just seems to let White have what he wants without uh, enough of a fight. So after King H7, White trades, doubles on the D file. Now, they brings the rook all the way up to D3 because there's some possibility that White could bring the queen behind and put all the pieces, heavy pieces on that file. And now Smith's Law puts the knight back on E4, and it's kind of noteworthy that the knight doesn't actually jump into the D5 square in this case. The knight certainly would look nice on D5, but it doesn't attack anything. It actually would clog up white's threats on the D file, whereas E4, uh, the pressure on the D file is extremely intense, and uh, black is really, really suffering. So bishop F8 give some defense to the, the pawn, rook d5. Uh, white has some ideas of queen d3, or possibly even bring that, the rook up to d3, and then the queen behind to d2. Um, when you're harassing a pawn like the, the d6 pawn, it does make sense to put your heaviest piece in the back, because you obviously can't afford to trade your queen for a rook or a bishop. So you put all the other pieces first, and then you end up uh, capturing the queen last. So here Denker plays queen g4, and he's realizing that a purely passive defense of the d-pawn could actually make matters worse. For instance, if uh, rook fd7, queen d3, king g7, black can't really improve his pieces very much, now white can play a typical ploy to take advantage of this kind of pressure on a weak pawn with all the pieces lined up in a, in a pinning situation. King f7, now c5. And that collapses black on, on d6. Didn't have time to get the king over and defend d7 uh, to, uh, to kill the pin for white. So queen to g4. Possibly setting a little bit of a mini trap for white. If knight takes d6, bishop d6, rook takes d6, black has queen takes d1. And the position black gets uh, two rooks for queen. There's absolutely no reason for white to allow this possibility. In this kind of position, white can really afford to take his time. and doesn't, doesn't have to cash in on the material if he doesn't want to. So he simply plays rook on 1 to d3, so that rook is no longer available to for capture. And now if um, black goes back with the queen e6, in this, in this variation, white can even play c5 right away, because now he can take with a knight, forking rook and queen, and it's going to win an exchange quite cleanly. So black really has to give up the d6 pawn in some fashion. And he plays bishop to e7. If queen e6, queen d2 it was pretty much going to force the same thing. So white takes the pawn on d6. And by the way, white doesn't necessarily have to do this. Um, a lot of players would maybe go into for some kind of torture with king to g2, followed by possibly h3 or f3. The idea of f3 would be to make sure the knight is anchored on e4. And also there's an idea to play a, a4, a5, and soften up the queen side. But Dismissal doesn't mess around because it's quite strong just to take this pawn. White not, not only wins the pawn, but also creates a weakness on e5. And really the best that black could do here is to trade and maybe play something like queen f5, and just kind of hang around in this position, play down a pawn, and, and hope that uh, he'll maybe get a draw on a rook, a rook and pawn, or queen and pawn ending. Down a pawn, sometimes you can manage to finagle a draw in the end game. But um, Danker doesn't really want to go too passively. He plays rook df f8, looking for counterplay, 
But after that move, we can say with total assurance that Black is simply lost. And Smyslov uh, opportunistically grabs the pawn on e5, not afraid of Black uh, penetrating to f2, uh, getting his rooks active on the f file because after rook d7, Black is going to have to trade one off uh, right away anyway. Now White, by simple means, just trades and plays rook to d8. Well, this is forcing the wind of war material. White puts both heavy pieces on the eighth rank, and it's interesting to note that while doing that, the black queen still does not have any place to penetrate. So g5 is the best black can do. And while white doesn't get an immediate checkmate, doesn't really care too much. Now, taking the pawn h6, Smyslov has a two-pawn advantage. Any uh, end game, rook ending, queen ending, whatever, is going to be totally hopeless for black. So to queen f5, white um, seems that his pieces may be temporarily out of position, but very nice move. Rook to d1, just coming back for defense, threatening rook f1, uh, pinning the queen, and here white is just regrouping his pieces. And we see that with the two-pawn advantage, white can wield the, the queen trade as a club. Black uh, will last longer if he trades queens, but ultimately be a hopeless position. Now, Denker plays g4, which perhaps loses a little bit more quickly than leaving the pawn there, but uh, position is, is totally hopeless. Rook f2 just, just covering that second rank for the moment. Black can't really do anything useful. So queen d3 um, well, that gives white the option of playing rook e2, maybe chasing the queen to a, a weaker square. Basically, white can just kind of see where black positions his pieces and then will find a way in. Now, if black plays, for instance, queen b7, white can simply play queen d5, force a trade, two extra pawns in the endgame. So rook g5 was played, rook e2. The white starts to creep forward, taking the e-file. The rook can come back to the f-file if he, if he so desires. Of course, black doesn't have a whole lot of moves to play, um, whether he has anything useful or not. Uh, he's in near Zugzwang in a lot of cases. And in fact, after queen d5, queen f7, Rook e6, and this move does seem to bring about a zugzwang. Uh, there is just no useful move at all. Obviously, king f8, queen d8 would not work out too well. And uh, king h7, queen e4 is a similar disaster. Probably the best black could do is to uh, trade queens with queen b7 or queen f3. Both moves will jettison the g-pawn. And then why will be three pawns up in a rook and pawn ending? Certainly no point in uh, playing that out against, uh, at the time, a future world champion, Vasily Smyslov. Uh, at the time, in 1946, was just uh, 25 years old, entering the prime of his career. But uh, he gives a hint of why he was such a strong player for so long. So that... Uh, that wraps up uh, the Game of the Week uh, tribute to Vasily Smyslov. Uh, one uh, important bit of information before you leave, uh, I have the announcement for the uh, selection for the, the, uh, the Game of the Year contest for the month of March. Uh, we will be picking uh, a game of, the, uh, of, the, of, of each month uh, for selection for uh, ultimately a contest for uh, ICC members. Uh, there'll be m much more information on this as the year goes along the contest. Uh, the the uh, ICC members will vote on their, uh, their choice at the beginning of, uh, of next year. But the, the selected game for the month of March is uh, Navarra against Rager. That was uh, last week's game very uh, complicated wild game. I do tend to lean towards those uh, uh, to give you. So that will be the selection for the month of March. Well, 
that uh, that's that then. Um, uh, I'm Joel Benjamin. Always a pleasure. And I hope that you all have uh, enjoyed uh, this week's uh, episode of ICC's Game of the Week. Visit www.chess.fm.